few announcements before uh, we continue from where we left off last week. So the holiday of Shavuot is coming up. And the holiday of Shavuot is one of our favorites. We all get together. We have a delicious dairy lunch. We listen to the Ten Commandments. We stay up late the first night of Shavuot studying Torah into the wee hours of the morning. So much that we are used to the holiday of Shavuot, which is going to have to be slightly different uh, this year due to circumstances. So let me just tell you a few things that we are planning. There's still more being planned and uh, publicized, but for, for right now, and p- please pay attention. First of all, for all children, and children mean children at heart as well, we're going to be giving out ice cream cones in honor of the holiday of Shavuot. Our ice cream parlor will be open this Sunday at four o'clock. From four o'clock to five o'clock, you just drive by the parking lot, you don't get out at all, and you will be given ice cream cones, they'll be given ice cream in containers, you'll have toppings as well. So if you have children, grandchildren, or you yourself feel like a child and would like an ice cream for the holiday of Shavuot, just, just let us know, there you go, Mount Sinai ice cream cones to go. We ask if you can let us know by Friday, so we'll be preparing different uh, toppings for you. So you have there, you can either just call the Chabad, which is the easiest, 818-991-0991, or a simpler way is right here on the chat, you can just type in a net message and Hannah will see the message in which you say, yeah, please, please put me down, I'd like to come get an ice cream cone on Sunday, that will be Sunday at four o'clock. We're then also going to have a taste of Shavuot that will be on Thursday. And that will be from two o'clock to three o'clock. There is a flyer on the screen right now. Uh, and that's gonna be combined with a toolbox for all different things for the children to have for the holiday of Shavuot. It's called the Shavuot Sea Kids Toolbox. Again, if you have children, you may want to pick this up. The Taste of Shavuot's gift bag is going to have lots of dairy treats for the holiday. These are gifts from us to your family. All we want to, you to do is to let us know that you plan on attending. Again, you don't have to get out of your car, drive safely through our parking lot. Everything is being prepared according to code. Everything is being prepared with, with uh, gloves. Uh, and we will hand you your things for Shavuot. The Taste of Shavuot's gift bag will also have a brochure in there that has everything you need to know about Shavuot, all about the Ten Commandments as well, stories about the holiday of Shavuot. So you'll have treats, you'll have stuff for the kids, and you'll have information. Again, this is all for you as our gift. We just need to know before that you plan on coming. Ice cream Sunday at 4 o'clock, Taste of Shavuot Thursday, which is the eve of Shavuot, from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Also, every year we always had our TED Talks leading up to the holiday, and we have six presenters that speak each for 10 minutes about Shavuot and their own life experiences as well. This year we're going to be doing it the night before, and it's going to be on Zoom. It's going to be Wednesday evening, a week from tonight at 7 p.m., and you'll be getting uh, emails about our uh, pre-Shavuot TED Talks as well. So we're trying to do everything we possibly can to bring the holiday to your home this year in any way that we possibly can. Last week, we started speaking about the chosen people, and uh, the topic would be that you can run, but you cannot hide, which means it's part of who you are. It's part of your essence. You can try to hide from it, but it's always going to catch up to you, and it's always going to be right in front of you. I told the story about the fellow from Argentina, if you recall last week, in which he didn't know if he believed in God, He didn't know if he was an agnostic, if he was an atheist, Um, and yet at the same time, Jewish tradition and Jewish practice continuously followed him wherever he went. So we we use the definition of a Jew is someone who is religious without knowing it. And we could look at individuals that claim to be Jewish but don't practice any of Judaism, and you can think that they're conflicted or the truth is that you can see that is the holiness of Judaism, that it's part of the soul and it's part of who you are, and it really doesn't make that much of a difference as far as your essence goes, how much you practice. The essence of the Jew is always holy. The essence of the Jew is always there and will always come through. 
how we express that, how much of, of our mission do we accomplish, that's up to each individual in our observance. And therefore, our observance of the mitzvot, our keeping of the commandments, allows us to be in connection, in direct connection with our soul and with God. Only by Jews do we find that the connection to God has little to do with how I feel or how I think, that it's more the essence of the person, the essence of the soul. It's by virtue of the soul, the peace of godliness that's within you. So the greatness of a Jew is not so much that he or she does a mitzvot, it's that he or she is a mitzvah. It's who you are and it's what you are. We spoke last week about the word heritage. Heritage is something that's passed down from one generation to the next generation and it belongs to you regardless of how much you claim it or even if you disclaim it. And that's why I say you can run, but you cannot hide because sooner or later, machrezes, it comes back to you. Now, each and every single one of you that's on right now has a story to tell about your own journey. The very fact that you're on right now in an afternoon studying Torah together here means there's something about your soul that was kindled that says, I'd like to connect. How did you get to this point? What brought you to this point? I'll ask it in a different way. Was there not a part, a time in your life where you said, this is not for me. This is not part of who I am. I'm not one that believes in Torah. I don't practice mitzvot. And yet somehow the path, the direction, the journey, it brings us there. No one forced you. No one said you had to. In the shtetl days, perhaps our parents and our grandparents could have said to us, you must go to Cheder. That's not today. All those individuals that are listening to me right now, whether live or later on in, in recordings, did anyone force you to watch this? Did anyone force you to attend the Torah class? Your soul brought you here. The journey of your soul brought you here. Machrezes, we're always going to come back. Now, some of our journeys, and for some of us, it's quick, it's easy. For some of us, it's a journey of decades. For some, it's a journey of a lifetime. There are individuals that are with us right now that are in their 80s and their 90s and they're first embracing Torah. They're first studying Torah. And there's a beauty to that because at some point in our lives, the soul will awaken. Now, why some people earlier, some later, this is God's business. This is God's decisions of how he creates and sets up the journeys of each and every single one of us. Back in 1929, there was a young man by the name of Menashe. Menashe lived in Israel in the city of Hebron. Now this Menashe was sort of the black sheep of the entire community, not just of his family, but of the entire community. Everyone in Hebron knew Menashe. Why? Because he was a rebel. Oh, was he a rebel? He had contempt, he had disdain for all of his religious brethren. And Hebron was a very religious community except for Menashe. And he would seize upon any opportunity to heap scorn about all, on all those that practice. On Shabbos, he would have this motorcycle that made a lot of noise. And he knew exactly what time davening in the shul would end. And so he would screech right by the shul, just in time as people were coming out of shul. And to just make matters worse, he would have to have a cigarette in his hand and be smoking the cigarette while on the motorcycle, right outside the shul, in Hebron, in a religious community. That was his statement to the people about how much he doesn't buy into this, that he's not part of this. Who are Menashe's friends? Everyone needs friends. Menashe made friends with the local Arabs, and he would hang out with them, and he would drink with them, and this is what he would do. He would smoke with them, hang out in their coffee cafes, in their apartments. Those were his friends. But the Jewish community, nah, that wasn't for him. If you know your history, and I would say the date, August 22nd, 1929, it was a very dark day in Israel, especially in the city of Hebron. It was known as the Hebron Massacre in which the British mandate, the British soldiers allowed for there to be armed Arabs, and they came streaming in from all surrounding areas, beating and stabbing 
and shooting every Jew in sight. And after they killed the Jews in the streets and in the synagogues, they started going house to house looking for new sacrifices. Eventually, they came at a house where Menashe was there, and he was there with his friends, his Arab friends. And the gang that came in for their terrorist attacks point to Menashe and they say, and who is that? And the Arabs in the apartment say, hey, leave him alone. He's one of us. He's one of us. Leave him alone. And they turned around and they left and they started going to the next apartment. And suddenly and inexplicably, Menashe comes running after them and he's yelling at the top of his lungs to this gang of kill killers. I'm not one of them. No, I'm a Jew. I'm not one of them. Because at that very moment, when he heard his fellow friends saying, he's one of us, he realized that separation, that he was permanently separating himself from his people. And something within his soul at that very moment said, you can't be silent. You can't accept this. I'm not one of them. I'm one of the Jews. If anyone has been to Hebron, you'll know that there's a museum in Hebron dedicated to the Hebron massacre. And there, there lists 67 names of the righteous souls that lost their lives on that bloody day. And one of those 67 names is the name of Menashe. He gave his life that day to be part of his people because his soul, his neshama, refused to accept that he's not one of us. The Talmud tells us that a person can acquire his entire world to come in a single instant, in one instant, in one moment. What leads a man who denied and scorned and alienated himself from his people all of his life to do this? The neshama, the soul. The soul knows that we are part of a chosen people. The soul knows the Morasha, the heritage that we carry. And the soul communicates to us and sends signals to our heart and to our mind and tells us, this is who you are. You can deny it for only so long, but at some point, the truth enters into our behavior, the truth enters into our heart, the truth enters into our soul, and suddenly we feel something kindling within us. Torah, Machrezes, Alachsanya, Shalo, the Torah will always return to its hosts, and we are the hosts of the Torah. I've seen it in so many different ways. People who may go off searching, people who felt that traditional Judaism is definitely not for them, and suddenly a little mitzvah here, a little tefillin over there, just one time someone asked as we spoke the story last week, and suddenly something kindles within you. A kiddush on a Friday night, a challah on a Friday night, a little observance of this holiday and of that holiday, and suddenly you find yourself saying, there's something here, there's something here. Everyone has their own story, and this is not a commercial to try to convince everyone listening to become observant overnight. But what I do ask is that we each open our heart and open our soul and understand, you are as chosen as Moses. You are as chosen as King David. You are as chosen as the Baal Shem Tov. Pick any of our great heroes throughout our Jewish history, and you say, they were a chosen people, and I say to you, yes, and so are you. So when that soul communicates with you, try that little mitzvah. Make it part of who you are. And you'll see, it will talk to you. It will continue mitzvah gororet, mitzvah. One mitzvah will lead to the next, will lead to the next. No one needs to force anyone to do anything. We just need to inspire ourselves and let our neshama talk to us. I'll share another story with you. You may have heard me tell this before, but it's a very powerful story. This goes back some decade where there was a young yeshiva boy his name was Mordechai. He lived in Rockville, Maryland. And during the summer, he decided to volunteer, to volunteer at a Jewish senior home. And he would give up his two months of his summer vacation to volunteer there, whatever he was needed to help with the seniors. One of the tasks that he had was to take care of the chapel. 
The Jewish senior home had a chapel there, and those that wanted to come for the morning prayers could come. Those that wanted to come for the afternoon prayers could come, and he would show them what page. If they had 10, he would make a minion for them. He was, that was his responsibility, being that he was a yeshiva boy, he would know how to do this. And so he would ask some of the other volunteers that were there to go out before minion time just to simply tap on everyone's door or to go in the hallways and say, for those that would like to join the services, it's going to be starting in 10 minutes. There was one individual on the second floor that when this volunteer came around to say, in 10 minutes, we're going to be starting the service, started yelling at the volunteer, leave me alone with these services. Leave me alone with these prayers. I have no interest in it. Stop telling me every single day what time the services are. And he really gave this volunteer a hard time. So the volunteer went over to Mordechai and said, you know, you give me this job to go through the hallways. It's not the most fun job. I kind of got yelled at today for doing it. The Mordechai wondered to himself, why would someone yell at you if you're simply inviting them to a service? You're just saying, if you'd like to come, you can come, and we're starting in 10 minutes. He asked, who was the individual that abused you? So he told him the name of the person, and after services were over, this Mordechai felt, you know what, I'm going to go and talk to this fellow and give him a piece of my mind. You don't have to yell at our volunteers. You can speak nicely. You can say you're not interested. But why the need to really let the volunteer have it for announcing what time services are? And so he finds the individual on the second floor and he says, my name is Mordechai, I'm here for the summer. And I sent the volunteer up to simply tell everybody what time services were. And you seem to give him a hard time. Look, if you don't want to come, that's perfectly fine. But simple respect, you no need to, to be harsh. So the man thought for a moment and he said, young man, I want you to wheel me to my room. He was in a wheelchair. Wheel me to my room. I want to tell you something, but I want to tell it to you in the privacy of my room, not out here in public. So Mordechai did. And when they were in the room, he told them, I want you to know, I came from a very prominent Hasidic family. I came from Poland. My father was a Hasid. My grandfather was a Hasid. His father was a Hasid. We were a very known Hasidic family. When I was 12 years old is when the Nazis invaded, we were rounded up and we were sent to a concentration camp. I was from the lucky ones, if you can call that, that I was still with my father in the concentration camp. Most families were separated. I and my father luckily were in the same camp together and we were in the same barracks together. Now in the barracks where we were, there was one individual, one Yid, one Jew, that had a half of a pair of tefillin. He had the shell yad. He had the part of the tefillin that go on the hand. He didn't have the head one. He had just the one from the hand. But it's still a mitzvah. It's still something. And so they would secretly wake up early in the morning, and they would put on that one part of the tefillin. Of course, my father would be part of it, being the chassid that he was, even though it was risking his life. Now, he was mentioned that he was 12 years old at the time. It's coming close to his bar mitzvah. So this elderly man is talking to Mordechai now in the room in this Jewish senior home in Maryland. He says, my father was determined that for my bar mitzvah, we need to have a whole pier. Just a half a pier is not enough. And so he had heard that in another barracks, there was a Jew that had a complete pier of tefillin, and that that Jew was no longer alive, and that the tefillin were there. So my father felt the need to risk his life on the day of my bar mitzvah, to go across to the other barracks and to try to bring those tefillin to our barracks so that I can put on tefillin on the day of my bar mitzvah. I begged my father not to do it. I said, you're risking your life. Half a tefillin is enough for me. Look, we're here in a concentration camp. I am sure God will appreciate a half of a mitzvah today. I think it's perfectly fine. But for my father, the chassid that he was, it wasn't enough. And so he huddled out before wake-up time, 
He went to the other barracks. I'm nervously watching him as he's returning. He's holding something in his hand. And at the moment he's so close to our barracks, I hear the shout of a Nazi halt. The gunshots go off. And that was the end. I ran out. My father was lying dying on the ground. I simply wanted to say goodbye. And the Nazi yells to me, get back in or you'll be shot as well. I kissed my father in his forehead, ran back into my barracks. And that was the last time that I saw my father alive. And so you ask me why I reacted this way? Ever since then, do you think I can pray? How can I ever make peace with a God that took my father on the day of my bar mitzvah because he wanted me to put on a pair of tefillin? That bar mitzvah day was the last day I saw my father. And so every time I get an invitation for a bar mitzvah, I never go. I never went. How can I ever attend bar mitzvahs? How can I make peace with a God and go to a synagogue? And so that's why I reacted the way I reacted. I shouldn't have been disrespectful for him. to him. It wasn't his fault. But that's the reason for the reaction. Mordechai heard this story, had no words to say other than, I'm sorry. I did not know. I'll never bother you again. I will never ask you again about being part of a minion, about coming to the synagogue. I have no words. And it bothered him. He couldn't sleep at night thinking about this horrible story, this horrified story. A man lived his entire life with this bitter memory and could never get over it, could never come to terms, never come to peace with it. What does one say? What words can one say? What speech can one give? What lecture, what sermon can one give with a story like that? How do you respond? There are no words to say. A few days go by. Mordechai is in his chapel. And one of the fellows from the senior center says, says to Mordechai, today is the yard site of my father, and I'd like to say Kaddish. They do a quick count. There's nine. You need 10 for the minion. There's only nine. So Mordechai sends his volunteer, just go through the hallways and see if you can round up a 10th. He comes back empty-handed. No one interested today. They're all doing other activities. They're not interested. And the fellow says, Mordechai, please, please, I've never missed saying a Kaddish for my father. Please, I need a tenth. What's he supposed to do? So Mordechai knows the wrath he's about to face. And he goes up to the second floor. And he knocks on the apartment door of his new friend. And the friend opens the door, the elderly man who told him the story. And he sees Mordechai there and he says, and now what? You promised me that you would never bother me again. Why are you here? To which he said, listen, I know I promised you and I will keep my word. If no, if you say no, no is no. But there's a fellow downstairs. And for him, it's important that he say Kaddish for his father. And he's in the chapel. And together we're nine. We just need a tenth. We'll keep it short. Just let him say Kaddish. Would you join us? And if you do, I promise the rest of the summer, I will never bother you again. But I just, I feel so bad for this fellow that wants to say Kaddish. Would you join me? And the fellow says, okay, just, just this one time, we have a deal, we have a deal. Before leaving the apartment, the room, he says to Mordechai, do me a favor. Go to the top dresser and go to the right side of the drawer and you'll see a pouch there. Take the pouch with us. He opens the, the drawer, sees an old pouch there, takes the pouch out and he asks the elderly man what's in the pouch and he says, Those were the tefillin that my father was carrying for me to put on by my bar mitzvah. When I went to kiss him goodbye, I took that which he was holding in his hand. And although I have not made peace with God, those tefillin are the last gift that I got from my father. And if I'm going to go to the chapel now, let me take those tefillin along with me as well. And so they took the tefillin, And Mordechai offered to put it on this man, which the man voluntarily said, sure, please go ahead. He made the blessings with him. He put on the, he said the Shema with him and then went to lead the services so he can do the Kaddish. 
so that the other elderly man can say the uh, can say the Kaddish for in, in, on honor of the yard site of his father. He came to the back of the shul to take off the tefillin. He found his friend crying, caressing the tefillin, and just crying, saying the words over and over, Tati, 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 I miss you. Tati, I miss you. And he told Mordechai, he says, I felt the presence of my father here when I put these tefillin on. All I can think about was the good times what it was like Shabbos in my house, what it was like going to Cheder, what it was like walking in the shtetl holding my father's hand. Suddenly my father was back in my life, not the way I saw him last on the ground, but the way I lived with him for 12 years before. I feel my father's presence alive with me now. Do me a favor, Mordechai. Come get me every morning. Every morning I want to daven here. And so for the next few weeks of that summer, Mordechai would make his stop, second floor, wheel his new friend on the wheelchair down to the chapel, daven with him. Sometimes there was a minion, sometimes not. One morning, Mordechai gets off the elevator, second floor, to do his normal chores. He comes to the room, and the elderly man is not there. He opens the door. The bed is empty. So he asks someone at the nurse's station, where, where is the elderly man that lives here? And she said, oh, I guess you don't know. He had a stroke yesterday. He was rushed to the hospital. And he just passed away. Mordechai was devastated. Obviously, this wasn't family, and he just knew him for a few weeks. But there was a bond. There was a connection here. He felt something as if this was his adopted Zaidi. And at the end of the summer, the summer was over, and the senior center did a farewell party to all their summer volunteers, and they gave a special award to Mordechai for all the work that he did at the senior center over the summer. And a woman came up to him and said, I know you don't know me, but I'm that elderly man that you used to visit every day. I'm his daughter. And I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for what you've done for him. Thank you for giving him back his soul. You have no idea the burden you lifted from him in those few weeks that you were with him praying every single morning. You have no idea how he left this world. And she says, I want to share something with you. I was with him in the room when he suffered the stroke and when the ambulance came. And he would not leave the room. He kept on motioning to something. And I knew he wanted something. And I picked up this bag that he was pointing to. It was the tefillin. He would not leave the room without clutching the tefillin and taking it with him. And when we arrived at the hospital, he was pointing to the tefillin and to his hand. And I knew it meant that he wanted to have the tefillin on. I didn't know how to do any of this. So I just, whatever type of way, I could put the box on his hand and just strap it on in any type of way. And the other one on his head in any type of way. And literally within minutes, minutes of me putting the tefillin on his arm and on his head, his soul left his body. And I tell you, he left this world bound to his father and immediately reunited with his father. And I have you to thank for it. Mo Russia, that word heritage, it's who we are. We can be distant for a year, for a decade, for a lifetime. But more Russia, the heritage is always there. It will always come back to us at some point or another. There was a, a boy named Dove Bear. Dove Bear lived in the early 1700s, so we're jumping a few centuries earlier. And when Dove Bear was seven years old, his father tragically passed away, leaving him and his mother all alone in the world. They shared a two-room house, if you can call it, more like a wooden hut. And that's where they lived with hardly any furniture necessities. They were very poor. As difficult as things were, there was one thing Dove's mother would not compromise on, and that was her son's education. So she would work two or three jobs just so that she can continue to hire Reb Yossel. Reb Yossel was that shtetl's finest malamed, the finest teacher there. And therefore, she wanted her son, her little Dave Bear, to study with Rabbi Yossel no matter what the cost. Furniture, she didn't need. Clothes, she didn't need. Fine food, she didn't need. A nicer apartment, she didn't need. Education for Dove Bear, 
That's, that's what she wanted. Every day she would be waiting outside Rabbi Yossel's place of learning for the lesson to end. And then she would make a walk back holding Dove Bear's hand. And the ritual was that Dove Bear would have to repeat the entire lesson to his mother on the way home. So this way she would learn everything, study everything. Her son would be repeating everything, so he would be studying it. But she would be learning from her son, and she loved this time more than anything else. Obviously, it's a broken family. Her husband had passed away. Dover was an orphan. She was a widow. So the bonding between these two was tremendous. The closeness between these two and the ability every day to spend this walk time, special time together, was something she looked forward to every day. Well, one day, again, this is now late afternoon, they're heading home together, doing their studies, and as they turn the street corner, they see a horrific sight. Their very humble home, their hut, was totally engulfed in flames, totally in flames. And the street was filled with the crackling sounds of burning wood. And crowds were running, yelling, and grabbing pails of water, but it was all too late. There was nothing left. The little house had burned to the ground. Watching this scene unfold, the shock of it hit so hard. All gone. Nothing left. And she's clutching her son tightly, and she can't hold it back, and she breaks down crying. And she's crying hysterically. So here is this seven-year-old boy now trying to console his mother after having lost his father. They have no house. They're homeless. They have no funds, no savings. And so Dove looks up and sees the pain of his mother and he hugs his mom and says, don't worry, mommy. Everything will be all right. Don't worry. And the mother wipes her tears. And she says, I'm not crying for the reasons that you think. You think I'm crying because we have no house. The house never bothered me. The poverty didn't bother me. The fact that we lost the house, we'll find another house. We'll find another place to live. The fact that I lost my clothing didn't bother me. I had no clothing. What I have wasn't worth much. The pots and the pans and the diner table, I'm not crying because we don't have a house. I'm crying because of one thing, my dear son. There was only one thing I treasured that we owned. It was the Sefer HaYuchsin. We had a genealogy book. We owned a book that was passed on from one generation to the next, going back many, many centuries, that every family put their names of their families in this book, and it was passed on to us. We owned that book. And I would read to you the names of who your father was, who your Zaydi was, who your great-grandfather was, going all the way back. So although I had nothing to offer you by way of physical and material possessions, I was able to present to you the rich heritage that you have, the people, the Zaydis, the Babis, who you came from, that genealogy book that I can't replace. That was burnt in the fire. And that is why I cry, my dear son, for I do not have now that Sefer HaYuchsin, that heritage book to read from for you. Dovber looks at his mother. Remember, he's seven years old. And he says to his mother, Mommy, Mommy, please stop crying. Please stop crying. Yes, we lost the Sefer HaYuchsin, but I promise you this. I will start writing a new one. It will start with us, a new book of genealogy, starting with you as the mother of the family, continuing with me and then continuing on forward so that our children and our great-grandchildren and our great-great-grandchildren, they will know who you are, mommy, the sacrifice that you made. His mother smiled. She wiped her tears, and she said, I know you will, Dov Bear. I know you will. Ladies and gentlemen, little Dov Bear of my story is the Magid of Mizrich, Rav Dov Bear, 
who was the student of the Baal Shem Tov, and he was the teacher of Rabbi Schneir Zalman, the founder of Chabad. He wrote that genealogy book. He started a movement that has gone on now for hundreds of years that has changed a world. So the very fact that there's a single Chabad center anywhere in the world is a tribute to this baby dove, there's a seven-year-old boy who looked at the flames of a fire and said, that can't destroy our heritage. It may destroy a book, but we will go on and we will start anew and we will build that heritage and we'll take the heritage from the past and we'll instill it within the future. Little Dove kept his promise, but that's a promise that we each need to make because each and every single one of us, we, we have received from our grandparents and from our great grandparents and from our parents. But the challenge for us is, what about the book that we need to start writing? The book that we need to put our lives on the top of the page and that we need to pass it on to the next generation and to the next generation. What are we writing on the pages of our story? Not just the stories of our Zaydis and Babis. Those are extremely valuable stories. And I'll continue telling you stories of our past, stories of the giants of the past generation, stories of the inspiration of those that either survived the Holocaust or gave their lives in the Holocaust. Because we are inspired by the stories of the past. But we also have to remember that we need to write our own story. We need to put our story down. We need to talk about our heritage and the role that we play in our heritage. You know, we can continue to ride on the laurels on the shoulders of our giants of the past, and we should. And we can continue to put up pictures of Zaidi and Bubby and say, those were my grandparents, and we should. But we also have to ask ourselves when our grandchildren put up our pictures, what will they have to say? We want to fill them with memories, not just that we took them on a vacation, not just that we went skiing with them, not just that we went to baseball games, of which I've done many, but we want them to talk about remembering lighting the menorah with Bubby and Zaidi. We want them to say, I remember on the Shabbos table with Bubby and Zaidi. We want them to talk about Passover with Bubby and Zaidi. We want to fill that book with other memories as well, memories of their heritage, so that when we sing the song, Torah, Siba, Lanu, Moshe, Morasha, Kehilas, Yaakov, that heritage is something that lives on. I mentioned before the fact that we're all together, that we're studying together, understand the value of it. This is writing your story. This is part of the book that you are writing, that you take the time to study, to learn, because our, our studies, when we get together and we study, we're studying Chumash or we're studying whatever subject it may be, this is not like taking a course in a university in which we're studying something that we may be interested in or something that we have to use in our business. It's about studying about ourselves. It's about taking a look at who we are, what it means to be a part of a chosen people, what did God want from us at Mount Sinai, what is our story, our personal story? And so when we join together and we study together, although I'm doing most of the talking here because we're on Zoom and I have to silence, mute all of you, but the fact is we are studying together. And hopefully you'll take some of these lessons and pass it along to others. And if we, that's about an hour or two, I'll put a recording of this out there so this way you can email it to others. What we're trying to say to our friends and to ourselves is, this is our heritage. This is the story of who we are. When we do a mitzvah, we're not being religious. We're not doing it because religious, we're religious people. We do it because that's who we are. That's what we do. We are being ourselves. That's the true you. So that when our children and our grandchildren will be at their crossroads in life, when they'll be faced with their challenges, these seeds that we have planted will be something that they can lean on, that they could rely on, that they can go back to. This is the book that we give over to them. There's a story of a centipede and a frog. These two hated each other. They just didn't get along. 
And the centipede would go so fast that every time the frog would try to catch up to it, the centipede would just take off and the frog could never keep up, which made the frog hate the centipede even more. So the next time that the frog saw the centipede walking down the street, he stopped trying to chase it because that was impossible. He calls out to the centipede, and he says, Miss Centipede, I have a question for you. I've been thinking about it all night. The centipede is curious. What's the question that the frog has been thinking about all night? The frog says, you have so many legs. When you walk, which foot do you put out first? If you have two legs, you know, you go right, left, right, left. I understand. You have four legs, you can figure out the coordination between the four. But when you have a hundred legs, who's the controller? Who says which leg should go first? It's unbelievable the body that you have and the complexity of the legs that you have. So tell me which leg goes first. The centipede thought about the question, scratched her head like, wow, it's a good question. I never thought about that. Let me think. And from that moment forward, the centipede never walked again. Sometimes we think something to death. The centipede naturally was always able to walk, but the moment the centipede needed to stop and think, do I move this leg or this leg? No, maybe that leg, maybe that leg. Suddenly, the centipede was paralyzed and couldn't walk anymore. So you hear about a mitzvah and you have to first philosophize it and you have to dissect it and you have to find out maybe it was because of trichnosis in the desert and that's why they kept kosher. Maybe it has nothing to do with God. Maybe it has to do because they didn't have refrigerators. And so we start coming up with every possible philosophy why this, why we do this and we don't do this and why we don't have to do it. And although Bubby and Zadie did it, we don't really have to because we live in America and we live in California and they lived in Poland and therefore they had to do it, but we don't have to do it. Sometimes we take a simple mitzvah and we dissect it and dissect it and philosophize and philosophize. And after 10, 10 and 20 years studying about something and then having to do psychoanalysis about it and then having to go to therapy about it, sometimes we should just walk. Just stop. Just do it. Just get into it. Just move to the rhythm, the natural rhythm of the soul of the Jew. And you'll feel how natural it is. No one's going to have to convince you of anything. It will just feel right. It'll just feel Jewish. It'll feel like something that's been part of you all of your life. Because it has. From the moment you came into this world, you were a member of the chosen people and you had this heritage as part of who you are. This little kindergarten girl comes home from school and she asks her mommy the question that mommy is always afraid a child is going to ask and never prepared to what to answer. Mommy, where do I come from? And mommy begins blushing. And mommy starts a story about birds and bees. The little kindergarten kids has no idea why mommy's talking about birds and bees. She's not getting anywhere. So then she gives the ultimate answer. Why don't you wait for daddy to come home and ask daddy that question? So daddy comes home and mommy says to daddy, we got a problem. Our little kindergarten kid is growing up. She has a question for you. Yes, my little child, what's your question? Daddy, where do I come from? Oh, daddy says, that's a tough question. It's going to be hard to explain, but I'm going to try. You see, daddy loves mommy very, very much. And when you'll get older, you'll understand that we have a very strange way of expressing that love. And somehow from that love, you come. And the child is so confused. What has this got to do with love? It's a simple question. Where do I come from? You know what? Let's go ask Uncle Tom, because he knows how to explain this to children. 
And so they go to Uncle Tom, and Uncle Tom starts drawing on the chalkboard. There's a sperm, and there's eggs, and how they meet up, and the kid is now more frustrated than anything else. Mommy is talking about birds and bees. Daddy's talking about love. This guy's talking about eggs. A little frustrated child says to all three, I don't understand. All I ask you is where I come from. Billy said he's from Philadelphia, and Mark said that he's from Texas. Where do I come from? Sometimes we overcomplicate a simple question. Where do I come from? And we have to go to Uncle Tom, and we have to go here, and we have to look it up in libraries, and look it up in Google, and we have to do the history selection of it, and the counter arguments of it. Sometimes it's very simple. You know where we come from? We come from Mount Sinai. That's where we became a people. Before that, there was an Abraham, there was an Isaac, there was a Jacob, there was an Exodus, and then we were brought to Sinai. And Sinai, God says, you want to marry me? And we said, okay, fine. There was, wasn't too many, too many choices. So we got married, and we've been married ever since. It's been a long marriage. It's had some very difficult times, but the marriage is still there, and we have survived this marriage. And we do things for each other. God does things for us. We do things for God. Sometimes God is pleased with us. Sometimes we're pleased with him. Sometimes God's not so pleased with us. But you know what? Sometimes we're not so pleased with him either. It's a simple story. It has its details. It has its mitzvot. I'm not simplifying all of it. Especially you get into the study of the Talmud. And there's so much there. There's so much to study. There's so much to learn. But in the very essence of it, it's who we are. It's what we are. We don't have to become new people. We don't have to be born again. We just have to be ourselves. I'm going to stop over there. We'll be back next Wednesday at 1230. Again, quick reminders. If you would like to have a Shavuot Mount Sinai ice cream cone for you, your children, and your grandchildren, Sunday at 4 o'clock, drive by the parking lot. We'll hand it to you safely. Um, just, if you want to just let us know that you're going to come, give us a call, drop us a message that you'll be here, how many kids you're going to be bring, bring with you. And then on, when, on Thursday of next week, right before the, it's the eve of Shavuot, we have Shavuot gift packages for each of you that has lots of Shavuos treats, Shavuos information, a toolbox for the kids all with Shavuos information. We would love to give you this gift. Just let us know beforehand that you're coming and we'll have it prepared for you. That will be Thursday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. I want to wish all of you a very good week. Have a great week, a wonderful week, and we will all be in touch. It should be a safe week for all, a healthy week for all.